Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Transforming a Yard from Invasives to Natives with Carrie Coyne. My name is Erica Van Franken. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation and its Grow Native program. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to Carrie. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. As the horticulture program facilitator at St. Louis Community College, Carrie supports students, faculty, and staff while managing the day-to-day -day activities of the program. She is focused on fostering students on their path to success and building a strong, resilient career and technical education program. Prior to her service at St. Louis Community College, she practiced landscape architecture at SWT Design, where she utilized her passion for horticulture, arboriculture, and native ecologies on built projects across the country. She holds a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and an Associate of Horticulture from St. Louis Community College. Carrie is a Missouri Registered Landscape Architect and ISA Certified Arborist. And now I will turn it over to Carrie. Thanks, Erica. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I wanna test one thing here. If, if I push this little pen, can I write? Do you see that line? Yes, yes. Okay, good. I might just want to uh, draw on something to share with you guys. So um, thank you so much for having me here today, um, normally when I'm presenting, I'm talking about uh, the garden here at school or somebody else's garden or a garden I've designed elsewhere. So I'm pretty excited to talk about um, my garden at home. And again, my name is Carrie Coyne. Um, and my husband and I are really partners in this garden. Um, so we've this transformation from non-native, which you can um, see here, this is the, our home in Webster Groves. This transformation, it's been a huge investment in um, time for us and our energy and in our emotion as well. And we are both pretty emotionally connected with this garden. Um, we've learned a lot of other property during this transition, sort of at a micro level, but we've also learned more and more together about ecology at a, at a macro level, you know, the way we, this site fits into the bigger picture. Um, so uh, today's presentation is really about the process that we've gone through from when we purchased our home in uh, the summer of 15, all the way through today. Um, and I know the little arrow goes on uh, there because we're, it's gonna keep going. It's gonna be um, something that we can embrace and steward for a long time. And I think we're both really excited about that. Um, for both of us, this was our, our first home and our first garden. And for me, it was really sort of a dream come true. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it was. <laughs> it is. Um, in my landscape architecture program, I learned a lot about um, the uniqueness of the Illinois prairie. And I started to explore, uh, you know, the sense of place that is so important to the Midwest, the, the prairie. And I started to explore prairie ecosystems as inspiration for design while studying at school. And then when I got um, a job in the Chicagoland area after college, I was working for a firm that did a lot of residential design. And um, we used a lot of native plants in, in those designs. Um, but while I was up there, one day my boss took me uh, to visit a prairie and it was my, the first prairie, remnant prairie that I'd seen. It was the first prairie that I'd seen. It was the Shoe Factory Road Prairie in the Chicagoland area. Um, and I was, it was exciting to see that. Um, and not long after that, he took me to another uh, prairie 
called uh, the Wolf Road Prairie. Um, and a few years after being in Chicago, I, I wound up coming back to St. Louis to practice. St. Louis kind of always calls people back, I think. Um, and I started to work for a firm that helped establish some of the prairies at Litzinger Road um, before it was Litzinger Road Ecology Center. Um, so I got to see all those little remnants of prairie and pieces of prairie that were like built in suburbia. They were these little oasis um, in this big, vast suburbia, you know, a lot of parking, a lot of streets, a lot of traffic. And they, they really inspired me. They were really amazing spaces. They gave me a feeling of um, seclusion. I felt so much closer to nature than just, you know, five minutes before in a, in a parking lot. Um, it, it, they were just different suburban landscapes than I'd ever um, experienced. And I was filled with joy and awe and curiosity. And I decided from then on um, that I would one day have my own prairie garden. And it took quite a while but in 2015, I, I knew that it wouldn't be the scale of any of those places, but I wanted to do what I could on this property. And my husband agreed to join me in that adventure. So that's kind of the baseline of, of where we start. And just one more thing, um, as, a, as a designer, I guess, I'm always, I, I look for inspiration and inspiration in landscape and e existing ecosystems. But um, this poem from the time I was in college um, sort of inspired me as, as well. It's the Emily Dickinson poem to make a prairie. And um, I would reread this poem for the first time in a long time. And as I was kind of tying loose ends up on this presentation. And I, you know, this poem was always sort of uh, obvious to me about the, the clover and the bee making up a, a prairie. They're the important parts of the prairie and the two go together, right? The clover needs the bee for pollination and the bee needs the clover's pollen. So that, I understood that metaphor for um, an ecosystem. Um, but until last night, I'd always thought about the reverie that it talks about at the end of the poem as just like a dreamy feeling like I would get when I'd walk into those little prairies. And um, I really started to read that differently last night. And a, a person who was sort of analyzing the poem stated this, and I thought, oh, that's exactly it. Um, that their reference to reverie was that without dreams or fantastic notions or theories and personal delusions, um, we could never get started on a crazy project like restoring a prairie or broader ecological restoration. It's, it's sometimes you just need to jump in um, and, and go for it. And you wind up with um, amazing, amazing spaces. So um, that's the story behind this story. Um, so this is our home, cute little uh, Webster cottage, uh, but there's, there, at the time we moved in, there wasn't a lot going on as far as wildlife habitat. There was a lot of turf. Um, there was a lot of wood chip mulch. Um, there were a lot of shrubs that weren't really adaptable, azaleas and hollies. Um, there was a lot of bush honeysuckle kind of surrounding the house and across the street and behind the house. And um, the hostas were about the only perennial in the space. There was a lot of winter creeper euonymus around, also just on the ground plane. And there were um, there were a lot of the, the vining Japanese honeysuckles. So from the front, it was cute and I could sort of look past all of that. Then you walked into the backyard and it was a little bit of a different story. Cuteness wore off. There was a ton of honeysuckle. Um, I couldn't believe how much honeysuckle I was seeing. There was also bamboo, um, that giant bamboo. And I'd, I'd seen that a lot in some really, you know, 
ornamental landscapes. And I always thought, I'm never going to plant that plant. And here the, you know, half of the backyard on this property, which is less than an acre, um, was full of, of that bamboo. And what I know about, or knew about bamboo is really, you know, it was tenacious. So here's another look into the backyard. Uh, the bamboos on the left, there's the winter creeper euonymus, which was growing, you know, across the ground. There was really not a lot of turf in the back. It was too shady. There were two big trees there, uh, uh, elm um, that was not doing very well and a mulberry. Uh, but they were really shading out the back and that winter creeper was just sort of taking over the turf. And then um, the winter creeper was growing up the adjacent fences, the garage in the back. It was really sort of, it was getting mature enough that it could flower and seed, which was really bad for this property, but the neighbors as well. So um, we were both really excited about the home and the neighborhood and the potential in the home. But I remember standing on this deck, scratching my legs because of all the mosquitoes that were out there. Um, looking at that um, winter creeper and bamboo, there's more bamboo right up against the house and thinking, I'm not sure we can do this. Uh, can we get rid of this much invasive stuff? This is a lot. And I called a couple friends of mine um, and talked through it with them. They coached me up and we decided to uh, go for it. So I started planting as a planter would. Um, and we created a concept plan for the garden. I didn't wanna make anything that was too, um, too formal. I wanted to keep the plan simple because I'd worked with plans you know, my whole career and I was sort of um, tired of that. I just wanted to be a little more loose uh, in my planning and be able to make changes on the fly and not get too uptight about the plan. So we've set some broad goals. Um, first and foremost, we wanted this to be a prairie habitat, you know, a, a wildlife habitat uh, for insects and mammals and snakes and birds and more. Um, you know, we both understood that we as humans have chopped up nature, really fragmented it a lot. You know, we both read Doug Tallamy's first book and just the training and what I'd seen um, in my career. And I knew that even this one little piece of property could, could help tie together um, other pieces of property and, and make a more cohesive whole for nature. So that was the biggest goal. Um, we wanted to have, a, let's see if I can use this now. Um, so we wanted to have a fenced in area in our yard uh, for our dogs. We have two dogs and you're gonna see their pictures. Um, so we had to make sure we had a part of the garden that was dog friendly. Um, that was important. We wanted to minimize uh, runoff from our property, um, contributing less to the flooding. There's a lot of flooding in this watershed that, that we're a part of, the Deer Creek watershed. And we wanted to um, use some design elements like rain gardens and um, eliminate turf add tree canopy, all things that would help slow down water and, and keep it on site. We wanted to create a path through the garden um, that would really give you lots of different ways to experience the garden. Maybe as hard as it is to do, get a little bit lost in the one acre garden. And so we created this path that kind of winds around the property into the backyard and then around back to the house. And I guess I could have given you a little background. This is the garage on the site. This is our home. This is a driveway out to the road. And then we're surrounded by neighbors on all three sides. Um, and we have a little deck that existed here. So really there were only a few things existing that were um, we were able to embrace in this garden design. And those were the mature trees that were around um, the deck. And um, you know the the topography of the land. We didn't need to change that much. It really slopes um, this direction, and mm -hmm. it made sort of an ideal mm -hmm. setting for mm -hmm. um, for rain gardens. 
And I'll talk just a little bit more about that. Uh, we also wanted to bring nature close to the windows. So when we were inside, we could see what we planted and see the birds. Um, so that was part of, you know, designing garden all the way up to the edges of, of the house. We wanted to use as many native plants as we could. Uh, we, we weren't married and I'm still not to being like 100% native, but I feel like as close to that as I can get uh, is great. And we do use some adaptable, not native plants. We wanted to build as much of the garden as we could ourselves. Uh, we had a limited budget, so we didn't wanna hire anybody if we didn't have to. And we wound up having to do that for a couple parts of the project. But um, we also knew that this would mean it would have to be a phased project. Like we weren't going to be able to um, do all this work at, you know, in one summer, like you might if you hired someone to do it for you. And, you know, the instant gratification person, uh, part of me is disappointed that we couldn't do it all at once. But the uh, native um, sort of more ecologically minded kind of person was inspired by Larry Wiener's book, Garden Revolution. You know, you got to really get to know your site and that takes a long time. Um, so giving it some time really was an opportunity for us. So you'll see the progress of this over, you know, over those seven years. Um, we, we wanted to observe things like the seasons, the sun, the shade patterns, the hydrology, the microclimates, and that, that period of time before we really started to get in and, and build out the bones of the garden allowed us to, to do that. Um, finally, we wanted to take advantage of some of um, what I call borrowed views, but there's a golf course across the street and um, there's some openings in all the honeysuckle <laughs> that is across the street. So we, we kept some of those views out into the, into the golf course so we could get some really long views. And then there were some views, you know, the neighbor's garbage cans, we knew we wanted to screen and things like that. So using plant material to help screen um, as well was, a, was one of our goals. This is in brief, the way we designed the rain gardens, the way that they, um, the water kind of showing the roof lines of the house, um, which was here. And then there was another roof line right here. This is the main body of the house and the little addition to the house. Um, so we collected all the rain off of this, um, these portions of the roof and put them in downspouts. And we're, the plan was to connect them out to a rain garden out here. So you can see these dotted lines. And then we did the same in the front where we took the big front portion of the house, tied it into some storm, um, some downspouts and drained it into a, a rain garden out here in front. And we have um, a unique house because we have the tiniest basement ever on it. And it's way back here. So this is pretty much all slab. like. Um, there's nothing under our foundation here. So we decided we could put this rain garden pretty close to the house because it was would never cause, as long as the slab was higher than the, you know, the upper elevation of a rain event, we were we were good there. And then the back rain garden is further away and it's downhill more. So that's where those wound up. Um, so after we did all the planning. Uh, the loose planning, I should say, my better half got to work on all of the uh, really big demo. Um, he had some very sharp pruning saws and loppers, which he broke one of each because there was just so much there and he was so excited to take it down. Uh, he used usually some sort of like 50% mix of Roundup or um, another glyphosate like um, drip. So when he would cut something like the bamboo, he would literally cut it and drip it and cut it and drip it. We, ne we never sprayed any glyphosate. It was very um, 
very pinpoint application, but that was really the go-to on all of the all of the invasives that were in the yard. He's also wearing long pants and a hat, and we sprayed lots of mosquito spray because it took a while to get that mosquito population down in the backyard. This was the first um, the the first piece of the puzzle. He took down all the euonymus along the back fence, and we saw a very old fence and some very big. Um, they were probably three or four inch diameter uh, euonymus shrubs growing up here. Then he started taking down the bamboo just a little bit at a time. And you see in this series of pictures, he's literally just either using a lappers and lapping them off and then dripping or the, the, the well, the saw was mostly used for the euonymus, the, the lappers was for this. Um, and he just kept going and he kept piling it up. And he kept dripping you on it, or uh, dripping a little bit of chemical on each one of those pieces. Um, so pretty soon we had actually a yard we could see, and we could see through to the neighbor's yards. And that was pretty exciting. We really we estimated the other night that we probably got about another thirty percent of uh, area by taking all those natives out. Our garden literally grew. Um, in just a couple of weeks by about 30%. You can see where the honeysuckle had really, and, and euonymus had really shaded and killed everything below it actually. And then what was left was the euonymus ground cover. So we gained a bunch of yard and we gained a bunch of bamboo. We um, cleaned it, stripped it, and kept it for, for use later, which we are still using now. Uh, you see some there, there's some in the corner, and we just had bundles and bundles of bamboo. Uh, we also started to clear away the ground layer. We just did that by hand, literally got out there and pulled duonimus out of the ground and started to bag it up. And we started finding some interesting things. Um, I don't know if you guys can see, but there's gravel here. There were a, a few uh, sort of ornamental gravel walks that were lined with um, pink granite cobbles. Um, so we kind of had some recyclable material, which was nice. We used the gravel as a, a base for some of the walks that we put in. And um, we, uh, use those pink cobbles to line some of the walks. You'll see those in some uh, later pictures. And then we just kept finding bamboo roots. They were, they went on forever. They went from the back corner of the yard all the way to the front of the yard. So we we were excavating a lot and and you know seeing what was under this blanket of invasive material. So we wound up with several weeks of um, compostable material that um, Webster Groves put in their yard waste bin. And then um, fall came and we took a little bit of a rest and we moved to the front yard after that. That spring, we um, started tacking that front mulched bed and you could see in this picture there was actually a layer of uh, plastic over the whole front garden. And I'm, it would probably have been there at least 10 years, maybe 20, it was hard to tell. Uh, but the soil here was really um, anaerobic. There was no life in it. This is one of the bamboo um, roots that had come around from near the deck and just kept growing. Um, so we started peeling away the plastic and um, actually above the plastic was that mulch layer you saw in that first picture, which was really pretty and did a good job hiding this disaster underneath. Uh, below that was some gravel, below, below that was the plastic and then the soil. So in this picture, you can see it's sort of gray and there's just nothing there. So we got a bunch of, you can see a corner of a pile here, a bunch of composted leaf mulch and started um, working that in just sort of lightly 
with not a rototiller, but just a like a, a fork, a big fork, and just worked it into like the first inch of the soil just to break up that really hard pan, um, that hard layer of clay, and to start some sort of um, decomposition there. And while we were doing that, we our contractor came and took out a lot of the hardscape on the um, side of the building or the side of the house where we could then um, put our pipes in. I mentioned those downspouts, one over here, one here that we connected and took all the way around the house to the rain garden. And right after um, we started doing that, I started planning a cover crop for the backyard because we had bare soil and I didn't want to lose any of that soil. So I talked to some uh, good friends who gave me some advice about the best cover crop to use in you know the middle of the summer. We decided to go with Virginia wild rye and we um, just seeded it by hand. You can see me with my five gallon bucket, which had some of that leaf mulch in it. And then I mixed in the Virginia wild rye seed and just spread it by hand very methodically and um, went back and watered it liberally for a while. And then summer went on. We started to watch the um, watch the Virginia wild rye come in. We delineated the paths we wanted. We started putting down some gravel under um, under this path. You can see the downspouts coming in. This is going to be the rain garden. We planted a few native things that we knew wouldn't be impacted by the construction that was going to be going on. And Steve mowed a couple of times. I think maybe he mowed twice while we've, uh, since we've owned the house. It was pretty exciting. We borrowed the neighbor's mower so that we didn't have to buy one because we knew we weren't going to have turf. And that fall, we started building the rain, Steve started building the rain garden in earnest. We got lots of material from Kirkwood Materials and he started, we um, set a, a level line there and he started laying in the, the stonework. And we did a little bit of grading in here to make a, a low spot so that when these pipes came down um, into this area, that that water level would raise a little bit before it would overflow around the wall on this side. After that was done that winter, fall, winter, we had some more trees installed where we knew they were gonna be okay and not um, get in the, the way of some of the other planning we had to do. So we installed a um, pond cypress here in the rain garden and a carpinus here in um, another part of the garden and a, that's our Berkwood viburnum, yes, down in the corner of the garden. Just wanted to get some of those structural um, plants in. That next spring, we took on the front lawn, um, just started to remove all by hand. It's crazy. My husband is a teacher and he had summers to, uh, to work. So there were a few summers where he just worked and worked and worked. So here he removed all of the, uh, the sod little by little. And then he even um, tackled, this was a gravel parking strip on the front of our yard. And we decided we wanted to get more habitat. So he dug out a bunch of gravel and brought in soil that he excavated from under the deck. And then we mixed in organic matter and we sort of revegetated this area. And that summer we brought in a lot of mulch because we had a lot of bare area in front. The, Cover crop was doing great in the back. The dogs loved it, uh, but we needed to get something on the soil in the front and we, um, we decided to go with mulch in the front. And it's just a, because the soil was so compacted up there from mowing and, and all that plastic, we decided to go with a, a leaf, a composted leaf mulch. And then we started adding a little bit of habitat like a, a wren box. And we purchased, filled the car a couple of times, uh, some plugs to fill in the rain gardens so that we could get, this is one of the rain gardens here. It drains some, some of the 
um, driveway into a little creek bed and then the downspout is right over here on the house and those both tie in and the actual rain garden itself is right here. So we wanted to plant those. We wanted to get plugs in those and get the those roots established as quickly as possible so we wouldn't have an erosion issue there. So we did that in the front and the back we planted. You can see a lot of the Virginia wild rye here around, uh, but then also some plugs in there in the rain garden. And there's the pond cypress. And meanwhile, um, the neighbor's little house uh, was torn down behind us and a big house came up um, and they have a lovely view of an amazing garden. <laughs> that fall we found out we were eligible for a Deer Creek Watershed Alliance grant which was so exciting to me. I remember jumping up and down when I got that letter in the mail because I'd actually helped people um, with Deer Creek Watershed projects as a designer and to have the opportunity to do our own garden um, because we had a smaller budget uh, was just really exciting. So we asked for the $5,000 grant and in kind we used hours that I spent designing our project and then the labor for installation as well. We started, this is just a picture of a friend we have now. As soon as we took out all that euonymus and honeysuckle and bamboo and got that um, cover crop in, we started seeing a lot more wildlife. And this guy loved that uh, Virginia wild rye. He sat on our deck a couple of times. I believe that's a barred owl, I'm learning, and um, tried to catch the bulls that were in the yard. It was very fun to watch. So we put plans together for, um, for that grant submittal. And I can talk about plants in particular, maybe in the end, if you guys are interested in that, but we created some little plant matrices. So rather than to get really dialed into the detail of how these plants were all gonna be laid out, we basically did some area takeoffs and knew that this area, you know, it had certain environmental um, influences like the big tree that was here, the water that was gonna come down the rain garden. So we developed a plant matrix for, for that zone and this zone and this zone and this zone. And then we counted up those plants. So we had a drawing for the front garden and a drawing for the back garden. And since we'd already planted the rain garden here and up front, we didn't need plants for those areas. So we needed plants for all the other areas. And uh, that spring, we learned we got the grant. It was very exciting. And we got our plants. We ordered our plants from Mervyn Wallace at Missouri Wildflower. And it was amazing to, to have them delivered and see them arrived. And there's one of our, uh, another one of our puppies who was also very interested in the plants. And we started planting. I laid out the plants uh, one by one. You can see them here in the front garden. And my husband came along with, uh, we actually used a bulb cutter. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Um, it's here in the bucket, you'll see it again later, but you basically step on it and it takes out a big plug of soil. So he would come behind me and I'd pick up that plug and he would dig the hole and I would put the plug in and break up that little soil and we just kept going. We also used a, um, a mycorrhiza while we were doing all of this. You know, looking back on all this now, an, an a little hand drill auger would have been much easier, <laughs> but um, that it worked. We got a lot of exercise. So we continued planting in the front. Oh, here's the, um, the plug um, tool. So there's a handle and that nice sharp metal silicon at the ends that we used. So we kept planting and we kept planting. And it took us probably mm, two weeks to get it all done. You know, we both, I was working and we were planting a little bit at a time in the evenings or maybe a big planting day on the weekend. Um, but it took a little bit of time. It actually got hotter than I wanted to or wanted it to for the plant's sake. It was a little too warm. We 
probably should have planned it earlier, but you know how the weather is. So we wound up using all our bamboo to literally we cut it in little short pieces and marked every plant in the back garden because I was so afraid that weeds were going to start coming in, which they should be expected. Um, and I wouldn't be able to tell the, the, you know, the very young plant from a weed. So uh, the dogs found it quite the obstacle, of course, um, but it really did help us mark what um, the plants we had planted. That fall, we planted a bunch of bulbs, about 700 bulbs, and then we waited. We waited for, um, for spring through the first winter, that's sort of a look at our front window. And you can see across, um, over here is the golf course view that we had for ourselves. Just a nice long view. And then spring 2019 came, the bulbs came up and so did a lot of the ephemeral natives we planted. And then plants started growing in. This is a view of the yard. You can see that sort of winding path that comes down and goes into the backyard. The plants started to, to fill in and look good. And our rain gardens were a little further along uh, because we planted plants a little earlier. So they were looking really nice too. And you know, at this time, stewardship really came the focus of what we were doing. So making sure we were getting in and weeding. Um, and the plants were really doing their thing. This is the same sort of view and the path is almost hidden in here that goes to the backyard and you can see Steve over there by the house. So we were trying to take care of what we had and watching habitat grow and interesting things like the spice bush swallowtail and this is a pipe vine that we planted and Right away, we had a pipe vine swallowtail uh, caterpillar, and, and I was learning about all these things because I just hadn't experienced things this intimately before. And so that's my reminder to, to hurry. <laughs> okay. And our dogs seem to be enjoying this space too. They had a lot of fun out there as well. They still do. So our focus of Stewardship really amounts to this and, and you know, that, that first year we really kind of were vigilant about it. And, um, you know, in February and March, we were doing um, a spring cleanup. We have, do have a lot of mature trees on site. So we were trying to leave the leaves and use those as a mulch. We didn't want to keep bringing mulch in. And we haven't really since then. We've been able to either collect leaves and move them to a spot on the site that we can kind of reuse them or just break them down in, in place. And in April, um, we did a little bit of infill with new plants, but we relocated plants. Anybody who has a native garden knows that things like to move around. So um, if plants were happier somewhere, we encouraged that. If we had little babies, I'd fill them back in. Um, and we eventually, over the past couple of years, have been dividing plants because they're getting so large and moving those around. We learned that in May, the garden really needs, in some spots, kind of a haircut. You know, there's some plants that just get really tall. Monarda, for example, um, can kind of flap over the path. So in May, we kind of do a selective walk through the garden and, and cut some things down. Um, over a couple week period, so our bloom time is spread out a little bit. And then all summer, we're um, looking for invasives because there's always going to be invasives and more euonymus just because that stuff exists around us. We water any new plants that we're putting in or anything we've moved. Uh, and we we've been watering a little bit lately because we're, you know, we're, we're short on rainfall uh, this year. So we've been we've been watering in some of the some of the trees really because they uh, can get pretty stressed, especially some of the younger trees. We protect any woody plant, any new woody plants. We've added a few more shrubs. I protect the small trees because the voles like to eat the um, the bark on those. We stake any plants that are just a little too big or floppy along the path, or just cut them out or cut them off. 
but plants are really very resilient. And we clean the bird bath that we have pretty, pretty regularly. We have some occasional activities we do, which are refreshing the wood chip pads, which you'll see a little bit more. And the path liners, we've used some logs to kind of line the path to create a little more definition. And we, we, we have to replace those every once in a while they break down. And um, I have an arborist uh, who work, who just, you know, works with tree health care. I have him come out and look at our trees um, fairly regularly, every couple of years, every few years, about every, well, we've had some dead wood taken out of a couple of trees twice now. Uh, and it's just, I know from experience here at the garden at school that if you lose a tree, you know, your, your garden changes. So it can change so dramatically. So I want to make sure we're taking good care of, of those big trees. Um, Spring rolled around, spring of 2020, when COVID struck, um, and we decided to reach out to bring conservation home and have the, some advisors come out and look at the garden and see if there was anything else we could do habitat-wise. And they had a good suggestion, which was getting the bird bath. So we did, we got the bird bath and a, and a dripper and I uh, have really enjoyed having that right in front of the front windows and seeing the birds. And I took my COVID money and I bought a trellis and put a native honeysuckle on it. And then in summer of 2020, we joined Shutterbee. Um, I don't know if you guys know that program, but it's an, like a volunteer organization of photographers. Probably there's some other photographers on this uh, presentation right now, that, but that's amateur and professional photographers who uh, photograph and identify bee population throughout the St. Louis region. So I, we do this in our yard. And it's run by um, Nicole miller Stratman from Webster. She's a professor at Webster University. And they're just trying to collect data um, to estimate the health of bees and how landscape management affects that. So that's been fun to be a part of. They actually came out in this picture. Um, and did a study that some of our graduate students did a study alongside me doing some studies in the garden. Uh, and then last summer, uh, we did a little more in fill of plants. The dogs have made a little bit of an impact in some of the spots in the back. So I'm just trying to find more resilient plants there. And we're really just kind of watching the plants. Um, letting them move around and helping them out a little bit, watering if, if they need it. And that sort of brings us up to the spring. Um, you know, we're still observing, we're still observing hydrology of the site. Our, our rainfall events are kind of changing too. You guys know the spring was pretty, pretty wet, a lot of rain. And spring was real slow to come on. So this is a pic, these are a couple pictures of the rain garden in action. We've got a rain chain at one end and a downspout at the other end. And all that water just flows through these sedges. There's like three or four different kinds of sedges here into this garden at the end. Um, it's just a low spot. So this is it filled with, filled with water. Um, and it's been fun to watch that. We actually know now that we probably want to move this path that's here. It's a stone path that was you know, existing. And we think we're going to move it closer to the house and just allow the water to sort of just fill the whole area in front of the house, the, the runoff. So we're, we're really watching at this point, observing, seeing how nature takes shape and how um, the ecosystem of our yard is working. And that's that's our story. I suppose um, like another seven years I could do this again because I'm sure there'll be more and more changes. Um, this is sort of the toddler years of our garden and we uh, are entering the preteen years but I'm I'm pretty excited about it and I'm was so glad to talk about it today. Thank you, Carol, for asking. And um, it was fun to take you guys on a tour. Carrie, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I really appreciate uh, 
how well thought out your presentation was of showing all of the steps. We do have quite a number of questions. I know you have a hard stop at five, so we'll just get through as many questions as we can. Okay. Um, there were a few questions here about how your neighbors uh, have, how did they um, maybe respond to removing the, the invasives that did provide privacy, you know, at first? And have you, have they interacted with you at all about the native landscaping? Um, we are so lucky in that regard. Um, so you guys saw in one of those pictures that the, that the little house behind us had been torn down and a big one put up. Um, so when we bought our house, there was no one living back there. Um, so we didn't have to deal with that, like, hey, we're right in your face, neighbor. Um, so that was lucky for us. And then the folks who live over here on the left, um, they don't spend a lot of time outside. So they, they like our outdoor space and their outdoor use didn't um, didn't conflict very much, and they saw the transition and they've really embraced it. Their front door is right here, um, so they look out on kind of where we have some of these taller wildflowers. And the homeowner there, just the um, Ellen, she loves it. She's, I'm, I'm talking to her now about maybe spreading the design over into their garden and Steve has offered to help take out some of their invasives. So um, we're just broaching that subject with them and, and they're really embracing it. And then the folks um, over here on this side, they have a lot of um, sort of typical landscape plants, but they're embracing natives. And I think they appreciate what they're seeing in our garden. Um, and we're kind of off the beaten path. So we don't get a lot of traffic. So there hasn't been a lot of, I mean, the neighbors, we have our rain, you can't see it, but our rain garden sign is right here and our rain conservation sign is right here. So we see a lot of people stopping, reading the signs, which is great. Um, we get a lot of compliments on the garden, um, but we're not in one of those really pristine parts of our town, Webster Grove, that's got, you know, mowed lawn and, and meatball boxwood hedges. The golf course itself the perimeter is pretty um, rough, lots of honeysuckle and, and trees that aren't in the best of shape. So I feel like we're in a good spot to have this kind of garden. And the, the arborist and um, horticulturalist that runs basically the Webster Parks District is really embracing a lot of native plants too. So the city of Webster, there's a lot of examples of this kind of landscape. So I feel like we're kind of fitting in. Great. And I'll just add to, uh, we may not be able to get to all the questions, uh, but we have lots of resources on the Grow Native website. Um, we have a Grow Native, or uh, we have a Grow Native Gardens of Excellence program where you can see examples of um, publicly accessible native gardens throughout the lower Midwest. And um, we can send a link to that. We also have a pretty extensive um, best management practices for native, um, for native plant installation and a native plant care calendar that kind of mirrors the things that um, Carrie was talking about, the, 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 the kind of the stewardship calendar that she and Steve follow throughout the year. Um, there were a couple technical questions on, so you, you used glyphosate for all of the invasive removal, is that correct, even the bamboo? Yeah, when we and, cut it, we would drip it. And what would you use, what was the device that you used to do the actual dripping? We actually used, I don't know if you could see it in that picture, but it was like um, a, a little handheld spray bottle. It was just like, I don't know, a liter of glyphosate mix. Mm -hmm. And um, we would put it on the foam dial. So it would just kind of bubble out of there. Um, so it was literally just dripping on there. 
Gotcha. That's great. And I think that's um, there are, of course, stronger chemicals to use, but I know we always recommend use the least level of toxicity as possible. So there are things that are stronger than glyphosate, but if you had success with glyphosate, that's fantastic. Um, questions on um, what about um, there are some folks who'd like to do what you've done, but they have tremendous deer pressure. Do you have mm. deer pressure or if not, do you have any advice? For those, we, yeah, we do have deer pressure. Um, it's tough. It's really tough. We've we've got um, two dogs. I, I think that that helps us. They are you know out and about in the yard. Um, so that's one thing we have. I tried to plant a lot like. I looked at Mervyn's catalog a lot. I studied Missouri wildflower catalog a lot. And he, you know, I don't think there's any plant that's really resistant to deer. To deer. If they're hungry, they're going to eat anything. But I really geared our plant list toward deer resistant plants. Yeah. So um, they do graze along this front um, of the garden, but that's about it. I will say I live in Jefferson City and we have quite a bit of deer pressure as well in our neighborhood and we have a but I will say that once the plants are established. Um, the, the grazing and nibbling here and there is usually not too destructive, but yeah. it is difficult when you're first starting out. Um, we do have on the grow native um, native plant database, which is searchable with filters, you can filter on deer um, resistance so that's helpful as well. Um, another thing that may be helpful to people in urban areas is we have a salt, salt tolerant plant list as well. Um, as Carrie said, I don't know that there's any plant that's truly that any that deer truly won't eat, but um, I do think that um, you will find uh, pretty good luck with uh, the list that we the, the the filter that you can use on on the database. Um, also, question about um, is there anything that you would do differently? Um, if you could do it over. Hmm. Anything we could do differently if we could do it over. Well, that is a great question. Um, the, the, perhaps the, the rain gardens, um, for example, and we are going to do it differently, really, that, that front part of this rain garden, the water, you don't really know, you think you know what's going to happen with the water that's on your property, <laughs> but you don't, right? That's kind of um, observation over time. And as your neighbor's landscapes change, the water that comes into your landscape changes as storms become more severe, you get different amounts of water. So, you know, as much as I've would say like, well, if we could have watched the water, the hydrology work on site, I might have put the rain, I might have laid out the rain garden a little differently in the front yard, but we needed to get those in to be that sort of infrastructure. So we're, now we're having to go back and we're gonna move that sidewalk and, and widen out that channel a little bit so that more water can um, get into um, the rain garden faster. The other thing, um, I don't think I'd do it differently, but one thing I've noticed is, um, let's see if I can find a picture of it. One thing I've noticed is a issue is we use this, it's a tiny chat, like a chat gravel, it's a granite trap rack. And I love the way it looks in the garden. Um, I love the way it's performing in the driveway that it's permeable, right? So water goes down into that perforated pipe that's under the driveway and filters down into the rain garden. Um, but we brought that gravel right up to our back door and um, we bring gravel in the house all the time. <laughs> so advice there would be to make sure that your entryways are you know um, solid, and we we've, we've since gone back and added some of those cobbles to make sort of a landing 
I think that threshold is a really important space. So um, thinking about the way that you're entering in and out of your garden, either from the, your car or your, the sidewalk or your doors. Those are two things that I could think of that I would do differently. Well, it was so successful. It's hard to see. I mean, it's just amazingly beautiful. And you did such an, a tremendous amount of work. Um, of course, rain gardens, for anybody who's not familiar with rain gardens, are, are, are designed to um, capture rain off of hard surfaces like rooftops and driveways, and then um, uh, let it percolate slowly into the ground and uh, filter out uh, impurities and so forth. So it's not rushing off, and as Carrie said earlier, washing off into streets and adding to um, flooding issues. So they are designed to drain, um, not to be permanent pools of water, but there was a question about mosquitoes. Do you find any issues with mosquitoes with the rain gardens or any other part of your property? No, no. The only parts of our property where there are mosquitoes are if like the gutter gets full of leaves, but that's everybody's gutter and everybody, it's everybody's responsibility to walk their property regularly and make sure there's nothing that's holding water. The rain gardens drain fast enough that um, there's never water in there long enough for mosquitoes to, to have the right habitat. Um, and we clean this um, bird bath out regularly. And we actually have a dripper in there so that water stays moving. But no, it's really more about just regular maintenance that you need to do around your house, whether you have a native garden or not, to, to keep mosquitoes in check. And the most of our mosquitoes come from our neighbor's yard. They're not out there very much. <laughs> yeah, that's very good advice. Even just flower pots or things that could be collecting water and then you don't even know about it. And yep. of course the gutters, as you say. Um, uh, I know we just have a couple minutes left. There were some questions about some of the specific plants you used, but I would, um, since we're running out of time, I welcome everybody to, um, you can rewatch the webinar on um, our YouTube channel. It will be, uh, a recording will be available. Um, uh, there was a question about the honeysuckle that you used on the trellis. I believe that was coral honeysuckle, which mm -hmm. is a native honeysuckle. There were questions about where to purchase native plants in the greater St. Louis area. Mm. Um, I advise everyone can go to grownative.org and the resource guide. And if you scroll on that page or there's a link, you can jump to a map that will show you locations of re retailers that sell native plants um, in the St. Louis area and throughout the lower Midwest. Um, let's see, th there was a question about um, soil amendments. I think you said you really didn't use any except in the front, you used some of the soil from under the deck where that um, parking area had been. And then you used, um, when you talked about mulch, you were talking about leaf leaf mulch. So yeah, so that soil in the front that we got from under the deck wasn't really like amendment. It was just filling in an area that had once been gravel. So we were just taking site soil and moving it to another part of the site. We've, the only amendments we really used were um, or um, composted leaf mulch, which we used in front to break up that real anaerobic soil. And then we did use a mycorrhizae when we planted all the plants. So any plugs, any, any plants, at least on that initial installation for that grant, we actually added a mycorrhiza in every hole. All right. Thank you, uh, Carrie. And we are just about out of time. Um, there are uh, some people had questions that others uh, answered in the chat, which is very helpful. <laughs> there are some um, suggestions for deer and vole repellent. Uh, I know per I personally use something called liquid fence, which is a, a natural uh, product that I mix with water and spray um, on plants. So you might try that as well. And with that, I'm afraid we are out of time, but we will send, uh, Erica will uh, send tomorrow a link to the recording and a link to some of the resources that were mentioned um, uh, uh, during the presentation. Carrie, thank you so much. You've inspired so many people and you have um, 
just added so much beauty and and habitat in your um, in your yard, and it just completely transformed it. Um, it was just fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie, and You're everybody. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. We'll have another webinar in um, in two weeks, so we'll have information for for you as well in the email about that. Everyone, have a good evening and. Um, and, and start making plants for moving in places <laughs> and planting natives. Anything that you do is an improvement. So um, you can always start out small and work up to, to bigger things. Thanks again, Carrie. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a good Thank night. Carol. Thank you. Happy summer. Bye-bye.